I want to welcome you today to the second installment in our series, I Know That I Know. And if you're new with us today or you're joining us in this series and it's a, your first time to be a part of this series, I want to welcome you. I'm glad you're here. But I also want to let you know what we are doing all throughout this series. You see, we believe that faith is something that we all need. As followers of Jesus, we need faith. But hear me, faith is built by what you know. It's not just built by these airy thoughts. It's not just built by this stuff that we can't really put our hands on or walk out. Faith is built by what we know, not simply by what we think. And so throughout this series, what we are doing is we are leaning into the truth of God's word. And we're digging and discovering and memorizing and understanding so that we can know that we know. And walk out and live our lives every single day of our lives for the honor of God with a, with a faith that's strong, a faith that doesn't get pushed over or, or, or succumb to pressure and win, but a faith that's able to stand with his head held high, with his back straight, his chest put out and said, I know that I know. And the primary way we're doing this throughout this series is each week we're leaning into one simple scripture that that really has truth that we need to know, hang on to, and live by through our lives. And we don't just want to teach on it, preach on it, try to understand it on that level, but I want you to memorize it. You see, I'm a firm believer that one of the greatest things you could ever do for your faith is to begin to, like the scriptures say, hide God's word in your heart. Begin to memorize it. Begin to get it on the inside of you. And that's why today, for our theme verse today, in every sermon throughout this series, we've created wallpapers for you to be able to download and put on your phone as a, as a lock screen image or for you to download and put on your computer or your tablet if you want to as a lock screen image so that every time you look at your phone, you would see this key verse. Every time throughout the week that you turn on your computer, you look to your computer, you would see this verse and you would find yourself beginning to memorize the truth of God's word and get that truth on the inside of you. That was available. Part one on our website and part two that we are diving into today is available at believing.church. So go download that, put it on your phone. I have heard from so many people this week who have downloaded this, put it on their phone, and they said, it's amazing how I, I actually already know that verse. And what a great thing to say. And so let's jump in with our second installment, the second verse, as we study God's word together today. It's found in the book of Proverbs chapter three verses five and six. This is where I'm going to draw your attention today. And for those of you, again, who may have missed last week, you can go watch that on YouTube. You can listen to the podcast, but, but this is our only verse. There aren't like, I'm not going to follow this up with a Bible story. This is our verse on today. Proverbs chapter three, verses five and six, but really it's just one big sentence, one thought. Listen to what it says. The writer says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. Now we're gonna do what we did last week. I'm gonna read this again, because this is all of our text, and then we're gonna get after it. But I would like you to, uh, as I read it again, Maybe begin to understand, maybe begin to break down a little bit what's going on here, because there's some very clear instruction. Take a look at it. He says to trust in the Lord with all your heart. It's the first instruction. He says to lean not on your own understanding. It's the second instruction. He says then, in all your ways, submit to him. And then he offers this as a, a hope in the end. He says, and then he will make your paths straight. So there's instruction, 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 and then clarity. Now, I know some of you look at this and think, oh, it's a promise. No, it's clarity. See, he gives three instructions that quite honestly feel like they overlap a little bit, and they do. Because they're in, similar, in a similar vein, in similar motivations to trust in the Lord with all your heart, to lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. They sort of seem to overlap. And it's almost like, well, if you follow this instruction and you follow this instruction and you follow this instruction, then there's this promise at the end. But it's really not a promise near as much as it is providing 
In reality, what is to come? Clarity. See, the book of Proverbs, where this is drawn from, where we are leaning into today, is an Old Testament book of wisdom. It's not a book of law. You must do this. It's not a book of prophecy. If you don't do this, then this is going to happen. It's going to go bad for you. It's going to go good for you. It's not that. Nor is it a book of promise. God says, if you do this, then I will. That's not what it says. The book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom. To think of it another way, it is, it's almost like rule of life, if you will. It's good advice. It's even beyond that, though. Because it's, it's really an invitation into a life with the collective thinking of God's people living God's way. That's what wisdom is. It's not simply, hey, you, you ought to do this, it'll go well for you. It's much more than that. It's this invitation to say, hey, if you would live your life this way, if you would prioritize the things that wisdom says to prioritize and deprioritize the things that wisdom says to deprioritize, you would learn from literally thousands of years of people who have followed God, people who follow God and had the scriptures just like you, and people who follow God and didn't have the scriptures just like you, people who simply live their life based on a work, people who have walked with God. You would be able to embark and enter into this collective wisdom. That's what the book of Proverbs offers us. It was a work given credit to King Solomon, who King Solomon, when he was appointed king, uh, prayed and asked God for wisdom. And God said, because you have asked correctly, I'm going to bless you with that and so much more. History tells us that Solomon was the wisest man to have ever lived and most certainly the wisest man of his time. People from all over the world would come to sit and have court with Solomon to get his advice, to get his opinion on things. And over the years, Solomon would collect the wisdom that he had found in his reading, that he had received in conversation, but also those that he had compiled on his own and created this this great collection of good thinking of wise decision-making, of how to follow God and what is the right thing to do. And ultimately, this was compiled into what we know as the book of Proverbs. But this wisdom is uh, fascinating because some of it most certainly does originate with Solomon, and it's his original idea. It's his original thinking. It's him uh, writing down what God told him to write. But some of it's also what was collected and compiled over time. And I think that's a beautiful picture of wisdom because for wisdom to work, I don't need it to be original. I just need it to work. Like for wisdom to do what wisdom is supposed to do, it doesn't have to originate or authenticate itself with someone and they are the sage and they are the source of all. No, 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 no. Wisdom understands if it works, I'm going to take it. Can I tell you, some people make their life too hard because they're trying too much to be original. They're trying to do things, they're they're trying to parent like only they were supposed to parent. What? They're they're trying to manage things that are very manageable, but they're trying to do it in a way that nobody's ever done it before. And why are you trying so hard? Now, please hear me. I understand in the importance and the significance of originality. In fact, I'm someone that thinks of myself as someone that very much like, like I walk to my own drum beat, if you know what I'm saying. Like I interact with people sometimes and, and, and they find out I'm a pastor and like, you are what? Oh, I wouldn't have picked up on that. And I, I like, it. I don't know why. I don't know if it's because of the way I talk or the way I dress or the way I interact. Or I don't know, but it, it's surprising to them sometimes. I interact with pastors and and I I explain sort of what our church does and and how we operate and things. And they're like, y'all do what with what? How does that even go? And we, I'm a believer in original. I believe that that's really what our world even needs today. Our country, most specifically, we need local churches that are originators that will lean in and, and dig their claws into the fabric of their community and find out what their communities need and find out how they can be a blessing, how they can be a city on a hill, how they can be salt and light and do that uh, 
indigenously in communities and, and look like the community and sound like the community and speak the language of the community and, and serve the need of the community. Like, like, I believe we need that. And that's not cookie cutter. That's not go run the play. That's something unique. But there's also some spaces in my life where I'm not looking for unique. You know what I'm saying? I just need it to work. Because it's not wise to bring, a, to bring a model to a city that will not work in the context of that city. But it's also not wise to try to reinvent something just for the sake of reinventing it. See, I feel this way very much when it comes to technology. I'm team Apple. I just am. I have been for, my goodness, a, a whole lot of years now. Like, I remember when I made the switch, some of y'all will remember this, they had MacBooks and you either got a white MacBook or a black MacBook. I got a black MacBook and it changed my life. I followed that up with the very first iPhone and I have been fully in the Apple uh, ecosystem ever since. And that's just the way I operate. iPad, I'm like, that's just my world. And the reason I like it is because it works. <laughs> like, I know that there are computers that are better values and I know that there are computers that can do this faster and that you can trick it out to do this. But hear me, I don't really want it to trick out because I don't want it to break. I just want it to work. Somebody say, I want it to work. Come on in the chat. I want it to work. I remember a few years ago, there was this um, particular computer company uh, that still exists. It's still around. I just don't know if they're on this extreme. But at that particular time, they were trying to push back against the uh, it just works side of Apple because Apple didn't really at that time give you a whole lot of options. It was like, if you want a MacBook, you will get this MacBook. You can have the black one or the white one. The black one's a little faster. White was a little slower. But those are your options. And this company was called Alienware. In Alienware, maybe some of you have this or have interacted with this, you could like buy the individual parts and like construct like it's Legos, your own computer. But that's neat if all you want to do is build a computer. I don't want to build a computer though. I want a computer that works. It's like when I was growing up, uh, one of my neighbors growing up, I remember he always had this Jeep in the driveway and he was always working on the Jeep. You know what I never saw the Jeep do? Move. Like at the end of the day, I don't want a Jeep that I'm just working on. I don't want a computer that I just got to play with. In, in, in the name of originality, in the name of look at what I'm doing, I need it to work because that is wisdom. But some people make their life real hard because they won't accept the wisdom that's already written there, the truth of God, the truth of his word that's already there, that's already been proven. They got to do something original. Wisdom ain't always trying to be original. Wisdom's trying to pass on the truth of sages following God and say, if you want to enter into this life with God, if you want to enter into this world and following him and walking in his ways, then this is how you should live. And these verses in Proverbs chapter three, five, and six invite us into wisdom. They give us this if then proposition based out of godly wisdom. And so let me ask you a question as we begin to break this down today. How many people want God to make the path that your life is on clear, straight, and unencumbered? I do. <laughs> I want God if he's interested. I want God if he can to make the path that my life is on clear. I want it to be straight. I want it to be unencumbered. And that is actually what the wisdom pro provides as, a, uh, as an end result he says, and then he, talking about God, will make your path straight. How does that happen? Well, he gives us the instruction. Let's break it down for a second, shall we? If you're ready to write this down, you're ready to apply some stuff to get this faith built strong, brick by brick, write this down, process this as we go through. He says, the first piece of instruction is this, to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. The introduction to this if then proposition is this. Trust God, bro. <laughs> you know? Just trust God. Trust God with the whole trust God with all of your everything that you've got. Now, many people, maybe even you, watching at church online, come on, listen to this podcast, watching on YouTube. Many say they do this but few actually do this. 
Because what we really want, we really love to trust God as sort of this safety net for our lives, but not as the leader of our lives. We want God to come to our rescue if we ever stumble or fall. We want God to come in and heal if we need healing, to come in and provide if we need provision. We want God to show up and save us because we're fallen. But the wisdom writer is telling us to trust God with all of our, he's saying, let God be the lead, trust him enough to let him lead your life. See, this kind of trust, to trust in the Lord with all your heart, please understand, and if you're taking notes, you can write this down. This requires full devotion. To trust in the Lord with all of your heart, it requires full devotion. It's to live out in your relationship with God what we often communicate when a couple gets married. You know, when a couple gets married, a minister like myself may, may offer thoughts and offer words, and at some point they're going to say something along these lines where they ask them, will, will you be faithful to them for better or for worse? In sickness and in health. In other words, whether things are good or whether things are bad, will you be fully Devoted. See, to trust in the Lord with all of your heart, it requires full devotion and it requires you coming and saying, I'm going to trust God regardless of what happens. Because most of us trust God based on result. If I expressed or expended some amount of trust and I feel like I got the result that I wanted, then I'm going to say, yeah, I'll trust God. But if I, if I, if I, if I tried it, it didn't really turn out the way I wanted to. It didn't really go like I had expected. I was expecting more. I wanted it to be easier. I was expecting bigger blessing, whatever. And sometimes we say, no, I ain't about that. The psalmist says, excuse me, the writer of Proverbs says, to trust in the Lord with all of your heart. To say good or bad, I'm on his side and I'm staying on his side. I don't care what comes or what doesn't come. Because trusting in the Lord with all your heart requires full devotion. And also understand, not only does this require full devotion, this affects all areas. Full devotion in some areas isn't full devotion. See, I bet what's probably true of you is that there are some areas of your life that you really do offer full devotion to God. But I bet there's also some areas of your life that you refuse to offer full devotion to God. That for whatever reason, that area is off limits. That subject matter, you are not interested in entering into a discussion. You don't really care what God says because you've already made up your mind. Full devotion in some areas isn't full devotion in all areas. So let me ask you, where is it that you don't trust God? Is it, is it at work? Is it some place you go? Is there a category or an issue? Where have you told God, this is off limits. I don't trust you there. I don't care what you have to say there. Because see, if you've got any space, any corner, any shelf in your life where you say, God, not there. I'll give you it, but not there. That's not all your heart. And here's the rub. We want full-time direction from part-time devotion. That's just true. We want full-time direction from God. We want our steps to be ordered by the Lord. We want him to make all of our paths straight, full-time direction. But we want it from part-time devotion. Could you imagine being in a relationship with somebody, a boyfriend, girlfriend, a fiance, a spouse, and they say, listen, I'm gonna be fully devoted to you Monday through Saturday, okay? Monday through Saturday, like, like I'm going to be fully devoted to you. You're going to get uh, all of my attention. You're going to get all of my, all of, all of my commitment. I'm not going to even like, like 
Everything I have, all the love I have, it comes to you. But I'm only one day a week. We'll just take Sunday. And on Sunday, you know, I'm, I'm going to go live my life. You know, and I'm, I'm going to go to the spot. And I'm, gonna see, I'm just going to see what happens. I'm going to see if somebody else is interested in me. And I'm, I'm going to see what they think about some things. And, and it'll just be then. But, um, you know, whatever happens, happens. But the other days of the week, you got me. But on this one day, I'm going to do, do what I want to do. I don't think we would call that full devotion, would we? <laughs> Even though there were a lot of good days of complete devotion. That period, that time where you say consistently, I'm not devoted to you then, that wouldn't really work. But that is how many of us be like with God. Except maybe it's the one day of devotion and the six days of undevotion. Maybe it's the one area where we commit ourselves to him, one area where we really do trust him and all the other areas of our life where we don't. The problem is we want his full direction. We want his leading. We want his guiding. We want his wisdom. We want him to provide and gird and direct and cover. But we only want to offer partial devotion. Trust in the Lord, wisdom says, with all your heart. And then it continues. It says, and lean not on your own understanding. Which makes clear that there are some things that we know or we think we know. Have you ever tried to instruct someone on a subject that they think they know on? You can't tell them nothing. I mean, everybody has stuff that they think they know, right? Everybody has those subject matters, those places, those spaces where they think because they read an article, or at least most of it. And so now I'm very, very well informed. I listened to two thirds of a podcast on double time speed. And so now I've done extensive research and I can tell you a thing. People who think they know something. You can tell whenever you enter into the subject matter with people. Because you may be having just a very normal conversation talking about things, but then you try to instruct or share your opinion, and your opinion is different than their opinion on a subject matter that you can't tell them nothing on, and all of a sudden their volume starts to raise. You ever see somebody do this? Maybe it was back at Thanksgiving, you somehow said something political, or at least they took political, and they have a different political viewpoint than you do, and all of a sudden somebody sitting across the table from you started, started to share their opinion, but it wasn't really opinion. They get loud. Volume starts to raise. Chest starts to puff out a little bit. All of a sudden they get a little bit on edge. And you can't tell them nothing because they know. You know, when it comes to our own lives, I think a lot of us think that we know best. That we're the expert on our own lives. And I get that. But maybe just maybe the creator of all things Maybe just maybe the creator of you knows what's best for you. Lean not, Proverbs says, on your own understanding. See, we try to go out there and figure out what sounds wise. And we get a couple people to support us. And we read this article and somebody has said, and I just really think it would work out better this way. And we tell ourselves, regardless of what God says, we tell ourselves what's wise. Please hear me. You can call it wise, but if God calls it wrong, it's wrong. You may say it's wise. You may say this is smart. You may say this is what everyone does in my situation. That's neat. That's cool. Lean not on your own understanding. Because you can call it wise, but if God calls it wrong, it's wrong. You see, there is understanding that will tell you differently than what God's word says. Don't lean on that. There is understanding that will tell you to walk in a direction, that will tell you you can trust this, that will tell you this is what smart people do. This is what astute people do. This is what wise people do. No, 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 no. Don't rely on that more than you rely on, than you lean on the truth of what God's word says. I mean, 
This point is so important to the wisdom writer that literally Proverbs 35 and 6, these are our theme verses. He's saying this, lean not on your own understanding, right? The next verse, verse 7, literally says, don't be wise in your own eyes. How often do we trick ourselves, tell ourselves that this is the right thing, this is a good thing, but it goes against what God has said. It goes against what his word says. It goes against what we know is right, what we know is true, but we trick ourselves and tell ourselves because we convince ourselves this would be wise. Lean not on your own understanding. I'm not saying it won't make sense on some level because it probably does. I'm saying if it's against what God's word says, then that's not what you want to lean on. When you do different than what you know God says, this is you leaning on your own understanding. I don't want you to get caught up in a poetic picture. I don't want you to get caught up in the way the wisdom writer misses it and not miss the practicality of what he's saying. When you do differently, than what you know God says, than what you know God wants, than what you know God has made clear. When you do differently than that, that is you leaning on your own understanding. It's when you decide that you are never going to forgive them because you know how bad they hurt you and the years of your life that they stole from you and how they stabbed you in the back, and how they've never apologized. They've never even tried to offer any remorse, and they hurt you, and they devastated you, and you still deal with the injury, and you decided, I will never forgive them. But yeah, you know, God's word says that, um, that uh, you've been forgiven of much, so you should forgive. Of much. You know that Jesus, in talking to one of his disciples, said that uh, one of his disciples thought that he was real smart on this forgiveness matter. And so he said, uh, Teacher, how many times should I forgive someone? Seven times? That was way more than the law said in that day. Seven times, teacher? And Jesus said, Psh. Try 70 times seven. What Jesus was saying is, I want you to lose count in the offering of forgiveness that you bring. But we tell ourselves, I'm never going to get hurt by them again. I'm never going to get hurt like that again. And so I'll never forgive them. Don't lean on your own understanding. We decide we're going to point out faults in other people. We're going to point out their mess ups and mistakes. We're going to point out their sins and their shortcomings. While all the time ignoring our own. Seems like Jesus said something to the effect of don't worry about the speck in other people's eye when there's a log in your own. But, but if I don't say, maybe nobody's going to see uh, the fraud that they are. Maybe nobody's going to see how they mess up. Maybe nobody's going to see how they pose in this way, but they really be this way. I got to tell. Don't lean on your own understanding. You decide that you can't afford to put God first in your finances because you've done some math and you've done some budget and you read a thing and it just, it doesn't work that way. I mean, if there's some left over, I'll give God a little bit, but you can't put God first. It's what you decide. But you neglect the truth of his word that says, test me in this. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so there may be food in my house. Test me in this. See if I don't open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessing on your life so much that you can't even contain. And you're like, well, I gave once and ain't nothing happened. No windows were opened. Lean not on your own understanding. You, you, you decide that this sin, you're just going to allow it to foster and to fester. You're going to do everything you can to manage it. And you're going to be able to keep this thing under control because you're strong and you, you, you got this thing figured out. And you neglect the fact that the scripture says run from the appearance of sin. If it looks like sin, baby, take off. Lean not on your own. Understand, don't even 
Listen, I know people say, I know somebody will tell you, I know you can find a YouTube video with a few views that will support. I know that somebody posted an article somewhere that will tell you. I know there's a TikTok that will tell you. Listen, do not lean on your own understanding. Why? Because you're trusting in the Lord with all your heart. And so I'm not going to lean on my own understanding. But in all your ways, this is the third instruction from Proverbs chapter 3. Verses five and six. In all your ways, submit to him. In other words, do what God says in all things, not just some things that seem religious. I think the word submit is chosen very importantly on purpose. Because what we do is we put ourselves underneath his leadership. And we say, all right, God, your ways are better than my ways. Your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. And so I, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to fall up under your leadership. And what you say do, I'm going to do. And what you say don't, I'm not. That's submission. It's a different picture than some of us think of when we think of submission. Because often when we think of submission, we think of forced submission. You will listen. I will make you. That's not this at all. This is a choosing to submit. Because this, God isn't making you. The end of this does not say if you don't do these things, you end up in hell. But you said you wanted clarity in your life. You said you wanted God to get involved in making your path straight. You said you wanted to know what to do and when to do it and what not to do and when not to do it. This is how from wisdom you get there. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him. It's like getting the advice from a leader or a counselor or a doctor of some sort. You ain't got to do what they say. But if you want what they say and the wisdom that they have to affect your life, at some point you have to submit. I don't do uh, very much counseling. Because for one, I don't necessarily have a ton of time. Two, I'm not a very good counselor. Uh, but three, I think I scare a lot of people off too. I, uh, I had this gentleman a year or two ago, older guy. Uh, approached me about helping to counsel him, process some stuff with him. He was in a difficult situation. He, uh, him and his wife had separated. They weren't divorced, but they were living in separate houses. Uh, she was living 30, 40 minutes from where he was staying, and uh, he was staying in kind of our neighborhood here and kind of came into the church and these kind of things in that season, and he, he asked me if, if, I would, if I would counsel him and help him. And I felt, I felt sorry. Um, for him. Um, but I laid out the ground rules up front. And I told him, I said, I said, look, I'm happy to meet you, happy to help the best I can. I told him the stuff I told you, but I said, Here, here's how it works. I said, I will listen because I genuinely care what's going on with you. And I will begin to speak back to you what I see going on as you explain to me what you see going on. And as you confirm that what I see is correct. I'm going to begin to give you advice. I'm going to begin to give you things that you should do. And then when our little time is done, you need to go do those things. If you come back to me and tell me you hadn't done those things, but you just want to keep talking about some things or fill me in on what's happened in the last two weeks or three weeks. Or, listen, listen, I'm not your guy. So he's like, oh, no, 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 I want to change. I want to get this thing fixed. I said, all right. So we had our first time and we sit down and he explains to me and I start telling him what I really see going on as he's describing things. And he's like, oh, maybe you're right. I said, yeah, I think I am. Because um, that's the thing about me. I'm opinionated. I might not be right, but I'm opinionated. And I'm going to give you that opinion. It's going to be founded and bathed in the word of God and the wisdom of, of life and the wisdom of uh, many counselors. But like, like I, I, I'm going to figure this out and I'm going to tell you what you should do. And I gave him, I said, you need to do this. You need to do this. You need to do this. He said, all right. He said, when are we going to meet next? I said, once you do that. He said, well, can we put something on the calendar? I said, sure. So we set up a time for two or three weeks later, and came back in, and he starts, you know, small talk with me, and I said, all right, tell me, tell, tell me how to go when you did what I told you to do. And he said, well, I got nervous. I said, so you didn't do it? He said, well, no, no, not, not, not all of it, not most of it. I said, then why are you here? He said, well, I said, no, 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 you got to understand something. 
I said, I made it real clear up front. I said, now, now we, could, we could turn this and this can quit being you sitting in here talking with the pastor about it and I can be a therapist. Because the, the game for a pastor in a, in a counseling session and a therapist in a counseling session are very different. You know that, right? Because most people sit down with a pastor and they want to talk with a pastor because they think they can talk to the pastor for free. And because they think they can talk to the pastor free, they think they can talk to the pastor as many times as they want to. And they don't really have to get to it because the pastor knows them, not just in this issue, but knows them as a person, knows them as somebody that might serve, knows them as somebody that might be involved in the church. Whereas the therapist, you walk in and you pay $200 to spend an hour with them. And so you, you cut all that mess <laughs> off the front and you start talking about what's really going on. And when the therapist says something, you put weight on it because you've paid to have their advice. And I told him, I said, I said, listen, if you don't know what I say, we can, we can turn this into a therapist uh, session and you can pay me to come talk. But I said, I, I'm not going to sit here and just listen and listen and listen and give you wisdom that you won't go do. Because I said, nothing is going to change in your home unless you do something different. And I have good news. He started doing what I said and things started changing. And they actually got back together, praise God. They ended up moving to another state together, which is also <laughs> praise God. But I tell you that to help you see how some of you approach church, how some of you approach scripture, how some of you approach the instruction of God's word. You, 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 you want to hear this stuff. But you don't ever want to change and submit to it. And you wonder why nothing looks any different. Stop expecting everything to be straight if everything ain't submitted. <laughs> okay? Stop expecting everything in your life to be straight. He will make your path straight. God, I want it. And he's like, yeah, but what about the trust in me with all your heart? What about how you lean on your own understanding day after day after day? How about the fact that in all your ways, you don't submit to me. If you would do those things, then there will be a clarity to your path that you've never seen in your life. But you got to stop expecting everything to be straight if everything ain't. Submit it. This ain't grace. This is proverbial wisdom. This is about you trying to walk in the clarity that is following God. And the reason it ain't clear is because you're not submitted. Because you trust in the Lord with all your heart. And you lean not on your own understanding. But in all your ways you submit to him. And then the confidence we have at the end. He will make your paths straight. I love that. There's a phrase that I still use that I think in most circles have, have died. When, when people ask me how I'm doing, I find myself uh, pulling back phrases from high school and, and, and college and, and a season of life where a lot of people said this and not that many people say this anymore. But they ask you, how you doing? And, and I, I'll respond even to this day. I'll be like, man, I'm straight. And sometimes people look at me and be like, I, I don't think I know what that means, <laughs> you know? And it is just slang, if you will. It just means I'm good, man. Everything's good. How's everything, uh, how's everything going? I'm straight. Everything is good. And I think some of us, when we approach this verse, whether you say that or not, this is the impression you get from the conclusion of Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. That if I do this, do this, do this, then God's going to make everything in my life good. The confidence in this proverb, though, isn't for ease or for goodness. It's that your paths are going to be clear. Listen to me, lean in. Clarity is a byproduct of alignment. I'm going to go slow so I don't lose you because I'm, I'm about to go deep quickly, but I'm going to walk. I'm going I'm, to I'm shovel one scoop at a time. Clarity is a byproduct of alignment. They talk about this with businesses, even with churches, with sports teams. Can I tell you that the best teams, the best organizations aren't always those that have the most money. They're not always those that have the most people, the most employees, the most whatever. The ones that are the most potent and powerful are the ones who, who are in best alignment because there's clarity on who they are and who they're not. 
There's clarity on who they should bring into the organization and who they should not. There's clarity on who would be a good teammate and fit our culture. That's what they talk about in sports right now. And who would not, who would be a, who would be a discontent, who would be a malcontent on this team. They said, no, 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 no. You've got to get alignment because alignment actually enables you to have clarity. Clarity is a byproduct of alignment. What happens is you know what to say yes to and what to say no to when you're aligned. Can I tell you, this is true for you as a follower of Jesus. Come on, the wisdom that Proverbs 3 brings to us tells us this. There is clarity in your future. There is clarity in your walking. There is clarity in your following God. Once there's alignment. Can I go deeper, but mess with you? The reason following God for some of you feels so unclear is because your life isn't in alignment. The reason maybe you say regularly, I don't know what God wants me to do, is what you say, but it's not true. The problem is your life is out of alignment. Your life is out of alignment, and because it is not in alignment, you are confused. Better yet, you are torn because you are trying to serve multiple masters. You will not be confused when you don't give authority to things or to people or to directions or to opinions that oppose the instruction of God. But when you align yourself with him, you align yourself with his purposes, you align yourself with his instruction, there will be clarity, there will be ease on your life. You will know that you know this is what I'm supposed to do. This is where God is at. This is the direction God has for you. You will know it. The reason you don't know it is because there's tension. It's because you're trying to appease God and man. You're trying to appease what God's word says and what that, what that blogger that you really, you really like them says. You're trying to appease God and yourself. And there's this constant pulling and it, and it feels fractured and it feels confusing and it's cause you're out of alignment. Can I go deeper? <laughs> the issue isn't that you don't know what God wants. The issue is you don't do what God instructs, so you're unclear about where you're going. The reason some of you feel like your, your tires are in the mud and you're just spinning out and you don't know how to move forward and you don't know what to do and you don't know how to handle this work thing and you don't know how to handle this at the house and you don't know how to handle this relationship and you don't know what to do with your money and you don't know what to do with your future and you're worried because you're getting older faster than you thought and you don't know, you don't know. It's because you're out of alignment. Write this down. Alignment precedes clarity. Alignment, somebody needs to type this in the chat, precedes clarity. You want clarity. That's what you want. That's what you pray. Some of you, that was your prayer today, even in service, even maybe to a host at church online. Maybe this morning as you begin to pray, maybe even as, as you got ready to listen to this podcast, you said, God, help me to know what to do. You want clarity. Alignment precedes clarity. You see, through the wisdom of Proverbs, God is telling us that if we align our lives with what he said, there will be such clarity in your life that you know that you know that you're making the right decision, that you're doing the right thing, that you're honoring God, you're taking the right next step, even if it's difficult. Doesn't mean that there aren't difficult decisions that you have to navigate. It just means that you know that you know because you've got alignment and therefore you have clarity. You know whether or not you should date them or not. So you're like, I don't really know. I've been thinking, I've been praying about it. You know. When I started dating my now wife, I didn't have to pray about it. I knew. Not because I had some feeling, because there was alignment. Some of you are trying to figure out what job to take. And you pull it because this says this, this feels this, 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 and you feel torn. It's like this would be more money, this would be better hours, and this would be this, and this would be that, and you feel torn. The problem is the reason you're torn is because your life isn't in alignment. 
Alignment precedes clarity. You would know if you got your junk in order. Some of you don't know what to do with, with your money and don't know how to, how to manage things and don't know how to do this. And you really want to honor God and you really want to give and you really want to do these things. The problem is you don't have alignment in your life, so your money's out of order too. You're spending money on things that you shouldn't spend money on. You're wasting money. You are giving money to things that, that don't benefit God and the kingdom of God, but yet you just keep doing it because that's just what you do because your life is in, in alignment. Some of you, you, you stress all the time over what to do with your kids and how to raise your kids and am I doing the right thing for my kids? And the thing is this, is that yeah, you're always going to have some questions a little bit, but you can have confidence if your life is in line. Because if your life is in line, then like, like you, you're doing what you know you should do because it becomes... Clear. Some of you are wondering whether or not I should forgive them, whether or not I should have them back in your life. You would know if you get this stuff in alignment. Alignment precedes clarity. Can I take it one step further as I close? If you know this, like if you would trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, and in all your ways submit to him, you would find that he will make your paths straight. And you know what would happen too? It'd change the way you pray. It would. In fact, to a certain extent, you may even find yourself praying less. Because some of you are praying about things and I think God is sitting up in heaven going, why are you praying about this? Align yourself. I gave you the wisdom. Align yourself and it'll be clear. Align yourself and you'll know what to do. Align yourself and you'll know the whether this is the right season or the wrong season for that. Align yourself and you will find out whether or not I'm in that or I'm not in that. Some things you don't need to pray more about. You need to get in alignment with what God said about. Can I tell you over the last many years as we have started believing and then led this church, whether we were portable or meeting in a permanent space, whether it was in the middle of a pandemic and people are safer at home or we are doing in person and online, but the majority of people are, are worshiping online or whether it's uh, now with multiple services in person and things happening online, whether it's we're serving a few meals a day to kids or serving hundreds of meals a day to kids, whether our grocery drive throughs are one thing or another thing or whatever's going on. There have been a lot of weighty decisions we've had to make. There have been a lot of uh, sacrifices that we've had to make personally, my family, that we've had to make collectively as a church to do what God has uniquely called us to do, to serve who he's called us to serve, where he's called us to serve, to be how he's called us to be. But can I tell you, a lot of them we haven't had to stress, fret, or pray fervently over. You know why? Alignment. You trust in the Lord with all your heart. You don't lean on your own understanding. But in all your ways, you submit to him. He makes your path straight. When the opportunity came for us to purchase this facility, we didn't really have to pray about it. We just had to act on it. Because we knew what God had called us to do. We knew the favor he had given us in this neighborhood. And we knew the relationships he was building. We knew the opportunities that were present and were in, for, in front of us. We didn't have to get stressed over it. When, when, when there have been other opportunities where it's like, well, you could do this. We, it was easy to shut some of them down. Because we know what God's called us to do. It's like Nehemiah said, I can't, I can't entertain myself with that. I'm too busy in the thing that God's called me to do. I can't come down for that right now. See, some of us are so torn because we're trying to please everybody. So torn because we're trying to follow everybody's advice and instruction. Hear me. You won't ever have the clarity you want without the alignment you need. Let me say that again. You won't ever have the clarity you want without the alignment that you need. You need to get your life in alignment. And then you will know that you know, whether you go to the left or to the right, 
Whether, whether things are progressing and other people are celebrating you or things seem to be stagnating or even regressing in other people's lives. You will know that you know that you are walking in the path that God has called you to because you trusted him with all your heart and you didn't lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways you submitted to him. And so the path you are on is straight. Friend, if you want straight paths, I want to pray for you today. But I don't just want to pray that your paths would get straight because that's a byproduct of your life getting in alignment. I want to pray that your life would come into alignment, that you would know that you know that the way that you're walking is in the way of God. Let me pray for you today. Father, I love you. I thank you for today. I thank you for your word, even your word that convicts and challenges us. And Father, I pray for your people here in your word today that they recognize there are places of their lives, maybe the entirety of their lives, that are out of alignment with your word, your will, and your way. Father, I pray you would convict them and help them to make changes so that they would trust in you with all their hearts. Not just some places, all places. And so that they would lean not on their own understanding. They would not try to rely on what they think is smart, what they think is wise, but they would lean not on that, but in all their ways, they would submit themselves to you. They would submit themselves to your purpose, your plan, your will, and your way. And Father, I pray that as they do that, their eyes would be open to see how straight their paths are. They would see you clarifying and organizing and clearing paths for them. They didn't even know what was possible. That they would have a peace and a confidence on the inside of them because they know that they know they're walking in your way and your way alone. Father, I pray you give your people the strength, the power, the confidence to understand this, to believe this, and to do this so they know that they know. I love you. Jesus, I pray all this in your name. And everybody said, amen.